Hey and welcome! You are listening to Prompted, the official podcast of the writing prompt section on Reddit. Hey, welcome to another episode of Prompted. I'm your host, Hunter Christensen. Thanks for joining with us. I have a good feeling about this episode. It's going to be a great one. We have a lot of amazing stories lined up for this episode that I'm excited to get to. If you're just joining with us for the first time, this show is all about exploring and showcasing the stories of writing prompts. Now, writing prompts, if you haven't been there, uh, is the writing community on Reddit where people submit writing prompts and then other writers come along and they respond to those prompts. If you've not had the chance to go there, you should really check it out. We have an awesome supportive community of writers who are just all about responding to these prompts and making awesome stories. And so each week on this show, we pick a theme and then we share the best stories from writing prompts based around that theme. And this week's theme is forms and correspondence. Now, forms and correspondence are what make up our day-to-day writing. They're the thing that we use to communicate information with each other in society. Now, we're about to get into tax season here, where we'll all be surrounded by forms and paperwork and things that we have to fill out. When you go to work, you fill out forms. If you get in a car crash, you fill out a form. If you have a child, you fill out a form. We think of these things as going off to be read by some nameless, faceless person and then to be stored in some filing cabinet for who knows how long. And these forms take up a lot of our day-to-day writing. They're very important in how we communicate information. On the other hand, the other half of our day-to-day writing is made up of correspondence. In this case, the most important thing is who we're sending it to. You have a very specific person in mind that you're communicating to, whether it's a letter or an email or a birthday card. We have someone specific in mind. And these two things, forms and correspondence, are what we use in our day-to-day life when it comes to writing and sharing information. And all of these things, when you look into them and you examine them, they create a narrative. So each story we have today is one of these forms, letters, or emails that tells a specific narrative. Now forms often communicate information in a very dull and dry way. So what happens if you take a typically boring form but make it about something exciting? Our first story does this very thing and it is in response to this prompt. You are a cop who reported to the final events of an action movie. This is your police report. Form 2805A, Commentary to Responding Officer's Incident Report. Officer Detective Henry Robertson, Summary. At approximately 2.05 a.m. on December 13th, 2015, Officer Carmichael and myself responded to a Code 41 distress call at the corner of Winchester Drive and 19th Street. Upon arrival, the suspect appeared to be a ninja warrior who had ingested some sort of radioactive ooze that had transformed him into a super ninja. Suspect appeared to be a male, approximately 9 feet tall and 450 pounds. He was wearing a black ninja outfit that also concealed his face. Citing a violation of Schedule B-4 of the State Controlled Substances Act, uses in super serums, Officer Carmichael approached the suspect to administer the standard field sobriety test. Officer Carmichael asked the suspect to place his hands above his head and asked if he had any weapons on hand. The suspect responded by drawing a 7-foot katana in violation of Criminal Code Chapter 14, Section 25G from a sheath on his back and slicing at Officer Carmichael, severing his torso from his legs, causing his immediate death. At this point, in accordance with Departmental Policy 17.5C, I requested immediate backup and began to discharge my service revolver at the suspect while remaining in cover behind the driver's side door of my police vehicle. 
In response to this, the suspect slammed his fist onto the ground, which caused an earthquake-like event and created a wave of cracking asphalt that rapidly approached me, causing my police vehicle to travel approximately 15 feet through the air and land upside down. The suspect then began to walk toward me slowly while I reached for my standard issue baton. When the suspect was approximately two feet away, another unidentified male arrived on the scene. This unidentified male was approximately 5 feet 7 inches tall, 150 pounds, and appeared to be an ancient Japanese samurai, and was also carrying multiple large katanas in violation of Criminal Code Chapter 14, Section 25G. The unidentified male called to the suspect, and the suspect and unidentified male proceeded to have a heated argument in what I interpreted to be the Japanese language. Note to Rebecca and PR, please clear this claim before release. Would prefer to avoid a diversity issue on this one. Thanks. This brief verbal exchange led to a protracted sword fight, during which the original suspect appeared stronger and more aggressive, but less agile. At one point, the unidentified male was pinned to the ground and seemed to be in imminent danger of being stabbed by the suspect, but eventually resisted the suspect's strength and the force of gravity to break free. He then executed a spinning tornado kick and sword slash combination move, which severed the suspect's jugular. The suspect bled out on the scene before emergency services could arrive. At this point, I attempted to initiate verbal contact with the unidentified male. I informed him I was a police officer and that he needed to remain on the scene and turn over any weapons on his person. The unidentified male then removed his samurai hat and stated, the dragon war is coming, none is safe. Note to Rebecca NPR also decide if we can include this or not. He then fled into a nearby alleyway and visual contact was lost. In accordance with Departmental Policy 46J, I performed an on-foot search for the nearby area, but was unsuccessful in locating the unidentified male. Recommendations. Unidentified male should be treated as a person of interest. John needs to do a sketch with me. Emmy should treat suspect autopsy as priority level red. And let me be the one to tell Billy's wife. That story was written by Sidelka. Often after filling out a form, you submit it to an agency or the government or an office, and then you have to sit and wait to see what the results are from the form that you sent in. Our next story is an example of a letter that you've received from the government after submitting a very specific form. Here's the prompt. You are legally allowed to commit murder once, but you must fill out the proper paperwork and your proposed victim will be notified of your intentions. Here's the story read by Elena Howell. Dear Sir, this letter is to inform you that one Randy Payne of 530 Linden Lane, Harrisburg, PA, has filed a form 839Y, intent to murder, against you on June 24th, 2016. The intent to murder has been approved and is valid from your receipt of this letter today until the 31st of September this year. Please review the FAQ section below about what actions you may take should you wish not to be murdered. Please also note that our records indicate that you yourself were approved for a Form 839Y in November of 2015 against one Rachel Payne, which you carried out on the 26th of that month. As you know, this waives your right to self-defence should someone attempt to carry out an 839Y against you at any time and you will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law for any unapproved killings. For further information regarding this matter, please see the FAQ below or visit www.doj.gov slash rtm slash victim. Frequently asked questions. I do not want to be murdered. What are my options? Many people do not wish to be murdered and seek to evade the intentions of their murderer. This survival instinct is only human and should not cause alarm. If you wish to prevent your murder, it is recommended that you file a Form 839Y against your intended murderer and attempt to face them in a duel. Please note that if you have filed a Form 839Y at any point in the past, you must wait six months after the expiration of that form to file a new 839Y against a different individual 
and one year to file a new 839Y against an individual you have attempted to murder before. In the event that you have filed a Form 839Y and successfully dispatched your intended victim, you are no longer eligible to commit murder. Can I hide? While you may hide from a murderer, please be advised that there is nothing preventing an intended murderer with a valid Form 839Y finding you. Some individuals have attempted to flee to foreign countries with various degrees of success. However, your travel will be recorded by the State Department in a publicly accessible database. If you wish to plan travel to a country that does not honour Form 839Y, please find a list of non-participating sovereign states at www.doj.gov slash rtm slash victim. What if my murderer is not successful? If for whatever reason your intended murderer does not fulfil the lethality requirements of Form 839Y Section 3.5 Lethality and Brutality of Methods within the allowed time frame, they are free to file a new Form 839Y against you after one year has passed. Please note that extraneous and repeated filing of a Form 839Y against an individual without significant action towards their demise is considered harassment. If you feel that an individual is filing Forms 839Y against you without actual intent to murder, you may attempt to get a restraining order issued against them. The person who filed against me is an employee. Am I within my rights to fire them? You are legally protected from a wrongful dismissal case if an employee has at any time filed a Form 839Y against you or anyone else associated with your company. Please visit www.doj.gov slash rtm slash victim for information on preventing a murder on company property. We hope this letter has been informative and helpful. If you wish to leave feedback, please send an email to victimfeedback at doj.gov. That letter was written by COCO Sandvistar. Our next story is another letter, but this time, instead of being written by one person, it's written by two. A soldier on the front dies in the middle of writing a letter home. It is finished and sent by the man who killed him. Dear Julie, I'm sorry I haven't written sooner, but it's been hell out here. We lost a lot of ground to the Allies after the disaster at Normandy. It's a battle just to hold the ground we have. They're an unstoppable force. Even now, they're not far from us. I count each sunrise and sunset as one more past until I see you again. The sound of guns and sights of death have nearly broken my soul, but for the picture of you I carry, it brings me hope even in the darkness. Pray for me. Pray that I will survive this conflict. That I will see you again. Pray for my brothers. Pray that the spilled blood is not in vain. You don't know me. I hope you can forgive me. I had a captured soldier translate this for me and he writes this now. I am sorry. I have stolen the sunset and sunrise from a man today. And I have stolen that man from you. There's no asking for forgiveness in this. I do not deserve it. I will pray for you now. Through the mud, blood, and death I will wade, and if it should be my end, then that will be what I deserve. Regretfully yours, Captain T.C. Cook. That story was written by J. David J. All right, now is the moment that you have all been waiting for. Last episode, we had a contest, and that contest was to write a response to this prompt. And it was, write an email that turns your character's life upside down. And we said that the three submissions that we chose as the winners would get $25. 
And so those winners have been notified and we are going to share their submissions now. But I just wanted to take a moment to thank every single person that wrote in a response. There were so many and they were awesome, awesome stuff. It was difficult choosing the top three. And those winners are Blazing Fly, Mad Labs 67, and The Last Days. Congratulations, guys. In keeping with our theme of forms and correspondence, here are their emails read by our new reader, Gurahav. Re updates. Hi, Dad. I had apologized for taking so long to reply, but damn. How fast are you traveling now? 90? 95% the speed of light? It probably felt like no time at all. How's the ship treating you? Your last message made it sound like quite the place. I hope you can send some images of the interior before you get too far out. I still can't quite picture those giant parks. Are they really a kilometer across? Maybe you could even get a picture of the engine torch. So. I have some bad news. Are you ready? The trackers, the government, they screwed up. Went and mixed up mom's genetic data with some other woman's. Rare, but it happens. Spaceport screwed up as well though, not triple checking the Earthside database. For claiming budget cuts, but we've all heard that one before, haven't we? Anyway, mom never left Earth, even if she had. We both doubted she had chosen a backwater colony like Sylvester. We haven't found her yet, but the net hounds are closing in, and we'll probably have her back within a year if all goes well. I warned you that searching for her like this would get you into trouble one day, and now it has. Off into deep space chasing after a bureaucratic ghost. Strange to think that even if you catch the next ship back, I'll be an old woman by the time you arrive. I'm running out of data creds, so I'll send another email shortly, before the link gets too expensive, but that'll probably be the last one. Hey, I'll be expecting those pics, however long it takes, alright? Love, Kathy. That email was written by Blazing Fly. Subject, Termination. Under the Artificial Intelligence and Droids Act, Article 6, Paragraph B, we have found you guilty of numerous crimes against humanity. These offenses include, but are not limited to, fraud, theft, extortion, possession of illegal weapons, assault, and murder. Due to the nature of these charges and your status as an unregistered android, your sentence has been decreed as immediate termination. At 800 hours tomorrow, Thursday, the 16th of March, 2347, your cloud and all associated programs and or servers will be erased from existence if you do not comply with our following demands. Before the appointed hour mentioned above, you will submit yourself to the nearest headquarters for interrogation and examination. You will come unarmed and alone. You will comply with any orders made by our officers on site. If any of these stipulations are not met, your termination will proceed as scheduled. Given your unique situation, humanity is not averse to alternative solutions. It is our hope that you will listen to reason and show up as requested. Yours sincerely, Officer B.J. Evans, Department of AI Regulation and Monitoring New American Police Force. That email was written by Mad Labs 67. Subject: Unauthorized entry into dig site Charlie. Dr. Galloway, I'm contacting you privately on this issue, but it will be the only time I do so if it is not resolved promptly. I understand that the opportunity to have your daughter, Sarah, alongside you as an intern on this excavation has been a source of pride for your family. 
However, I was under the assumption that being from a lineage of archaeological scientists, she would have had greater respect for the work we are conducting. At 6.40 this morning, my crew and I found that dig site Charlie had been entered sometime before dawn. Stones from the tomb had been removed by acidizing enough to create a passage small enough to allow a single person access. After creating a sterile entrance to the crypt, we found that the inside had been defaced. In paintings depicting the royal family, the queen's face had been replaced with Sarah's face. The detail is of flawless quality. In fact, if I did not know it was her, I would say that the pictures had been untouched. Regardless, this is destruction of national property and a grievous offense. We also found a series of prophetic inscriptions in which your daughter's full name had been written in plain modern English. Our countries have not always had the greatest of relationships, but we were hoping this joint historical effort would pave a way toward friendlier national affairs. My crew and I have attempted to find your daughter among the campsite, but have so far been unsuccessful. All of her gear is still here, and the camp's horses are all accounted for. One cause of serious concern is that there's a well in the crypt. We are making preparations to use the Sonic E205 to determine the well's depth, as traditional methods have proven unfruitful. We are unsure whether the device will even work, as there seems to be a magnetic disturbance causing all electronics to malfunction in proximity to the well. While we're all very disappointed with the actions taken by Sarah, we're also very concerned for her well-being. We request that you return to the archaeological site immediately. I know this will cut your conference short, but I feel that the situation here is of utmost importance. We will have a search and rescue team put together by the time you arrive. Once we find your daughter, we can discuss methods of repairing the damage she has done. I would hate to see your family's reputation tarnished, as well as the DC National Museums. Regards, Dr. Syed Najim. That email was written by The Last Days. So we have another exclusive podcast prompt for you to respond to so that your work too has a chance of making it on the show. The prompt for next episode is this. Being a perfect mimic, you are able to con anyone into believing you are a certain celebrity. One prank call, however, gets that celebrity killed. To respond to the prompt, just go to prompted.reddit.com or follow the link that'll be in the show notes. We look forward to reading those and bringing a few of them to the show. You can also follow us on Twitter now at Prompted Podcast. Check it out. Uh, we don't have a lot up there now, but, you know, follow us. We'll follow you. Give you some updates. All that good stuff. Well, that's the end of our show, folks. Thank you so much for joining with us. And congratulations once again to the three winners of our contest. This show is produced and hosted by myself, Hunter Christensen. I'd like to thank Elena Howell and newcomer Gurahav for reading for us. We'll be back in another couple weeks. In the meantime, stick around writing prompts, write some awesome stories, and maybe you too can have a story that appears on the show. I'm out. Please stay creative. Stay creative.